Welcome to Polite Conversations with Ina, Episode 6. Today, it's just me rambling on my own. After the saga with my last episode, please bear with me while I learn the tech skills to podcast and do interviews all by myself. Consider this a sort of practice episode. So, a lot of you asked about my thoughts on the recent Charlie Hebdo editorial, so here they are. Desperately trying to discredit victims of a vicious attack. How did we end up here? How is it that every time an Islamist terrorist murders people, one of the first concerns is Islamophobia? How is it that Muslims and devoutness become the primary victims and once again the deeply troubling underlying ideology and the framework it operates within are swept under the rug? How is it that so many scramble desperately to discredit in some way those who sacrificed their lives and demonstrated perfectly why we must stand united against fascists of all stripes? Like the Islamic fundamentalist they mocked, Charlie Hebdo was also a constant ridiculer of the French far right. For that, they've won a staunch supporter in me. I too often see people calling out one side or the other, but Charlie Hebdo calls out both the Islamic far right and the Western far right. Granted, one of these is a little more beheady than the other, a little more murderous, but pushing back against both is important and something I can really get behind. Even in this quote-unquote controversial editorial. In the very first paragraph, they call out those who pin every single problem on Muslim immigration, which includes the immigration of people like myself and Ali Rizvi, Faisal al-Mutar. Xenophobes will blame immigration, they said. Of course they will. That's what they always do. Everyone boils it down to their one pet cause. Rarely do people acknowledge that this comes about from a combination of several factors. We must be wary, careful, to walk that thin line between the Islamist apologist parts of the left and the anti-Muslim parts of the right. True secularism resides somewhere in between those extremes. Somewhere, I think Charlie Hebdo hits perfectly, which is why it causes a scurrying panic among false liberals who wish to hold anti-liberal religions in high regard for some unknowable reason. Yes, Muslims are a minority in Europe. Yes, Islam is not the majority religion. This has no bearing whatsoever on how toxic, dangerous, and unjust Islam can be if taken literally. I'm Pakistani and ex-Muslim, and if you want to talk about persecuted minorities, you should see how Christians and Hindus are treated in my motherland. I will absolutely defend minority citizens' civil rights and fight for them to achieve equality in the unjust state of Pakistan. However, even there, I won't be protecting Christianity or Hinduism from criticism by secularists. I'm not a fan of religion. I'm not a fan of Christianity, and I won't protect it even in a country where unfortunately Christians are mistreated. I will protect Christians and their right to practice, but Christianity is simply an idea, an awful outdated one at that. I will not say Christianity is feminist or deny its blatant homophobia, even in Christian minority Pakistan. It is that separation we need to see with Islam and Muslims as well even in lands where Muslims are minorities and are being discriminated against. I'm, af- I'm affected by that discrimination as well, but I'm affected by Muslim bigotry too. We need to strike that balance and move forward for the sake of everyone, including Muslim communities. Progress is what's needed, not defensive shielding of magical bigoted beliefs. I will stand up for the rights of Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Jews, Sikhs, and any others I may have missed, but I will not stand up for the rights of their religions, mere ideas we can do without. Please, everyone, etch this distinction into your minds. It's an important one. I'll stand up for any hijabi or niqabi being harassed or mistreated because of her appearance, but I'll never stand up for this symbol of female subjugation intellectually. 
These distinctions are hard for some people. That's how we ended up here, with liberals siding with Islamists, with feminists glorifying the niqab. The everyday people that were mentioned in the editorial were not an attempt to demonize the average Muslim, unless that's what you think of the average Muslim. Why is it that the majority of the world only sees the devout, bearded, and veiled as symbols of what Muslim is? Why is it that time and time again, liberal, secular Muslims are erased from this conversation? The beards and veils are our far right. They are our flag-carrying nationalists. They are what's taking over our colorful Asian cultures. They were once not the average Muslim. In Pakistan where we have no fear of being demonized by a xenophobic Western far-right, conversation against Islamists can happen more freely. It rarely does, but when it does happen, there are little snippets of honesty that you don't necessarily see here as freely in the West. For example, in the West, talking about Hijab has to be done with a certain caution because we truly do not want to empower those here who think it's okay to harass innocent hijabi women in the street. But back in my motherland, where we don't have a fear about that, many people call them what they are, a part of the political Islamization of our culture, complicit in the erasure and a part of the Arabization, the imperialism. They are imperialists, and many come to the West and highlight only Western imperialism. Hypocrites. How did we end up here? A place where my motherland once had clubs, bars, casinos, openly? How did we end up here? A place where my grandmother was free to dress in more revealing clothes in the public parks of Pakistan than I ever have been. How did we end up here? A place where religious terrorism is out of control in Pakistan, but Pakistanis come out in the thousands to celebrate a murderer to denounce a teenage girl like Malala. How did we end up here? A place where Donald Trump's bigotry is intolerable to Pakistanis, but worse bigotry, state-sanctioned bigotry, where they are not the subject, is praised. This is our battle. Everyone's together. Make it so. Don't make it about the East versus the West. Muslim countries are the worst victims of Islamism. Don't make an enemy out of anyone who wishes to raise a voice against this. Back to the piece in question, though. Here's another interesting quote, quote referring to Tarek Ramadan, a lecturer, writer, and someone who seems to be quite the Islamist apologist. He came to speak of his specialist subject, Islam, which is also his religion, rather like a lecture by a professor of pies, who is also a pie maker, thus judge and contestant both. I found the pie maker analogy perfect. Being a professor of Islam while also being an adherent is hardly an objective way to study or academically engage with the faith. It's like when they ask niqabis or hijabis for their views on these things, on hijabs and niqabs, I mean, they already buy into it. What do you think they're going to say? As Charlie Hebdo rightly point out, the attacks are merely the visible part of a very large iceberg indeed. They are the last phase of a process of cowing and silencing long in motion, and on the widest possible scale. I see nothing but truth in this statement. This walking on eggshells around one specific religion has got to stop. We got over the taboo of criticizing Christianity here in the West. The liberals even welcome it. As someone who feels oppressed by Islam, as a woman, as an atheist, as an apostate, I ask, when can we stop cowering to Islam and tend to its victims. The worst affected are the minorities within, the LGBT Muslims, the secular Muslims, ex-Muslim women, 
I always say that we need to start recognizing non-violent forms of Islamism as well. This is what will ultimately cause public opinion to shift. This is what will deter Islamists from wanting to move over here. Non-violent Islamists, that is. Not bans. This includes things like niqabs, gender segregation in public gatherings, religious schools, and mosques that, you know, are preaching extreme things. They should be looked into. If Pakistan had kept a better eye on these things, we would not be in this position today. But pandering to and opposing the same ideology simultaneously will never work. The woman with the veil that Charlie Hebdo mentioned? No one should bother her or harass her, but the concept of veiling women lest they provoke lust is not one that deserves any protection. The concept, it must be called out time and time again till it's recognized for what it is. The man with the beard and the prayer bruise in Pakistan. We always laugh about those with such bruises. I mean, what the fuck kind of rigorous headbanging on the floor needs to happen for such a permanent mark of piety like that to appear? I know plenty of people that pray regularly and go through life without such flashy public displays of their religiosity. Often, the marks are looked upon skeptically among liberals within Muslim communities, because it is said that many charlatans have faked this mark, which is not easy to get. They've done it maybe, you know, there's lots of theories, by heating the back of a spoon, pressing it against their forehead, banging their head purposely too hard on the ground. I think it's a spot-on observation. Amazing that they picked up on this from the outside, because they too can see how this urgent, artificial display of piety is worrying and shady. This is not demonizing everyday Muslims, because this is not the picture of an average Muslim. I mean, you rarely even hear of women ever getting this mark. I, I wonder how naturally it, you know, appears in men and not women. Hmm. Anyways, these are the ultra-Orthodox, and must be seen as such. Religious orthodoxy is, you know, in the 21st century, is a problem in itself. It's not bigotry to point this out. Here's another quote from the editorial that struck me as interesting. They are too busy lapping up his lunchtime sandwiches. Those he sells are fabulous. Though from now on, there's no more ham or bacon, which is no big deal because there are plenty of other options on offer. Tuna, chicken, and all the trimmings. So it would be silly to grumble or kip, kick up a fuss in that much-loved boulangerie. We'll get used to it easily enough, as Tarek Ramadan helpfully instructs us. We'll adapt, and thus the baker's role is done. Now, it's not quite as simple or conspiratorial regarding halal sandwiches. If he does own the cafe, surely it's his right to serve what he likes, just as a kosher restaurant has a high has a right or a vegan one. As much as we may not agree with their reasons for not serving certain things, it is their business. It does get kind of worrying though when they purchase something large and iconic with an existing clientele, a known menu, and then remove famous ham sandwiches, alcohol. This would be unfair. But it's not quite so black and white. And while the boulangerie is a bit of a weak analogy, the core message that we should stop receding, stop caving in, is one I wholeheartedly support. Though I do think the specific attack on halal is not the best way to disempower Islamism. Especially when there are so many better, more obvious things to point out. But I get the frustration. Sometimes people are just done. Done making accommodations. And they may not always sound entirely fair. But after your colleagues have been massacred for drawing, it's a bit much to ask that they seem perfectly level-headed at all times. Even in Canada, when we updated our sex ed curriculum in Ontario, Muslim parents were freaking out. 
at the thought of their children learning that LGBT families, people, should not be discriminated against. Of course, there were other religious parents too, but a large, large number of Muslims. My book, My Chacha is Gay, and I hate to harp on about this, but this is truly how, how toxic this relativism is becoming. So, my book, which is one of two few resources to familiarize specifically immigrant or Muslim Canadian children with the idea of LGBT diversity, it caused an uproar. And predictably, the schools that used it happily now backed away from using it ever again. Because the first time around, they got threatened and bullied by many you know, religious slash Muslim parents in all sorts of ways. So even though this specific subject is written into the curriculum, any attempts to teach Muslim kids with resources relevant to their communities is seen as Islamophobic. Not to mention, I'm a known critic of Islam, you know, also known as Islamophobe, so I imagine what any parent had to do to discredit or flag me as a horrible individual to school boards is show one of my many posts critiquing my own birth religion, a right afforded to any liberal ex-Christian that wants it, but not a right afforded to ex-Muslims. This is why we're here, why we ended up here, because we, who critique from within the community, are not seen as authentic, are not given platforms, are censored and silenced time and time again, our right wing is celebrated by Western liberals. And anyone else fighting from the outside to disempower this octopus of religious Islamic orthodoxy that engulfs us is shouted down as racist, ultimately providing camouflage for true racists and anti-Muslims. This is not about all Muslims versus the rest of the world. Separating into two camps is what the far right of our respective groups would want. We can stand together for free speech, for critique of religion, for freedom of religion and from religion, for dealing with offense responsibly. This is not to say that Charlie Hebdo is above criticism, but after they've been killed for cartoons, any shrieks of racist and bigot ring hollow, and it hurts to see so many big names jumping on that bandwagon. They can be crass, they can be crude, and sometimes unfunny. This is hardly the same as labeling them racists. I read an article on this very editorial by writer Teju Cole. It made my head hurt from the beginning. It is this narrative pitting all Muslims against the world, not Charlie Hebdo's, which generally mocks ultra-devoutness of any kind. It just so happens that too many Muslims would fall into the Westboro Baptist levels of devout. That's the problem, not the mockery. Wake up, fellow lef lefties. You don't want the far right seeing this gap and sweeping into mainstream discussions and hijacking them. I mean, Teju's article itself, I'll put the links in the description, is titled, Charlie Hebdo finally admits their racist prejudices. I have no words. His opening paragraph says they finally step away from the mask of it's satire and you don't get it to state clearly that Muslims, all of them, no matter how integrated, are the enemy. Really? Where? Where does it state that? The part where they talk about the guy with the manufactured prayer bruise on his head or the veiled woman? No, they do not represent all Muslims. They do not represent integration. They do not represent my family or the many families I know. Stop pushing such examples forth as normal Muslims. He also brings up one of the founders of SOS Racism, an anti-racist group that defended Charlie. He talks about how this founder is also the current French minister for women's rights, and how she said that women who wear hijabs are like American, quote-unquote, American Negroes, granted a terrible, terrible choice of words, especially for someone involved in an anti-racism organization. Whether some of it was lost in translation regarding the connotations associated with the word in French, 
versus English, whether it's just a, a translation to the word black, or whether it's a thoughtless use of an outdated, terrible expression. There's just no good excuses. None. But this is the guilt by association game. How are Charlie responsible for what a separate person says? It was a mistake. It should be owned. Whether her intent was racist or not, I can't say. But nothing I've seen from Charlie Hebdo themselves indicate they are racist to me. A disgusting charge thrown at those who paid with their lives for drawing. What is this desperation to discredit them by any means? Many of them died for fuck's sake, even if they were blazing KKK members. The, me the murderers are the worst ones in this. Surely people can see that, but I mean, it seems they can't. That's all I've got. And uh, I've got no fancy music to fade out with. But thank you all for listening and supporting Polite Conversations. You can follow me on Twitter at Nice Mangoes, no E in Mangoes. And please support this show via Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash nice mangoes.